My name is Ann Tompkins. I'm a pediatric specialist here at UC Davis Medical Center in the Department of PM&R Speech Therapy. I've been doing speech pathology for 12 years now and specializing in pediatrics for over 10. I want to thank Dr. A and the rest of the team for asking me to be here today. Uh, the objectives that we're going to be looking at today is a normal sex swallow breathe sequence in typically developing children. We're also going to be uh, reviewing the importance of chewing and feeding milestones in typically developing children. Also, we're going to be looking at cleft palates, low tone, cardiac conditions, and other anomalies that can affect feeding, which a lot of times we will see in Q22 and other neurodevelopmental disabilities. And towards the end of the talk, we're going to be looking at red flags to look for during feeding. So that way, as you're feeding your child and as they grow, anything that you um, may see that would be alarming that you would want to talk to your pediatrician or other uh, healthcare professionals about. So one of the big questions that we ask, especially as healthcare providers and uh, people that work with feeding is, you know, eating is thought to be an easy process that the majority of people like to do. So why is it so challenging for some parents to feed their child? Why are there some children that can't and won't eat food by mouth. And that is, you know, so often when we're in clinic, you know, parents come in and feeding is just not a pleasurable experience with their child. Feedings take all day, their child is crying, they're, it's not this um, very um, pleasurable, like this picture exhibits here with the child smiling and feeding the dog. It's nothing like that. What I would like you to think about is through development, what we're doing is we're laying the foundation for feeding. What we do know is feeding is very reflexive the first four to six weeks of life and instinctual. After that time, it's a learned behavior. So I would assume that a lot of parents that are in the audience at this time have experienced having four to six weeks of life in the hospital, in the ICUs. Um, breathing tubes, feeding tubes, none of those have been experiences that have been pleasurable for either the parent, caregiver, or the child. So now that first four to six weeks of life where that instinct is there and the child is learning to feed is not non-existent. And so now we're already behind in our development as far as setting the child up for a positive feeding experience. So I'm going to go over real briefly, this is just a very brief slide um, due to time, um, looking at acquisition of feeding skills. So the first um, zero to six months of life, like I said before, um, is a very reflexive um, time period for suck, swallow, breathe, and um, it's the child's primary source of nutrition. Um, at about six months of life, then what we start introducing is a spoon, the swallow is completely different. The lips um, are moving the food from very anterior portion of the mouth to the posterior portion of the mouth. And so it's a completely different swallow. So we're introducing spoon for experience and for pleasure. It's not for nutritional value. It's um, strictly to start building skill. So again, if you have a child who has medical conditions or um, any developmental delays, these acquisition of feeding skills can be delayed or very challenging for the child. Then at about 12 to 24 months of life in typical development, what we would see is child is starting to transition off the bottle, starting to drink from an open cup, straw, and also transitioning to more table-like foods. This slide has a lot of information. I apologize it has so much information on it, but what I do, the importance from this slide that I'd really like to capture is um, how complex the sex while of breathe is. It's um, again a reflex, the first six, four to six months of um, life, and um, it is something that is coordinated within about a second of the sex while of breathe. Infants are obligate nose breathers, and so um, if a child has any anomalies, um, difficulty passing air through the nasal passage, that can impact feeding. Um, we'll talk about it in a little bit when I get to the slides with the cleft palate. If the intraoral pressure is not adequate, 
that can make it difficult um, for the suck to be efficient and express adequate milk from the breast or the bottle. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at the child having an efficient suck, swallowing, which means you're closing off your airway, and then you're breathing. And this is very rhythmic, and as baby um, grows and, and develops, this becomes more efficient. Initially, it's more of a suckle. It's not a strong suck. And um, it's two or three suckles, swallow, breathe. And then as they develop and get more efficient through multiple feedings and experiences, then it becomes suck, swallow, breathe, suck, swallow, breathe. So again, you have a child with cardiac conditions, cleft palate, um, any facial anomalies, all of those, you know, what seem to be pretty basic functions can become very challenging for a child. And this is just a nice slide. This is um, anybody who works with infants would know this is not a slide of an infant, but what I do like um, with this slide is it just gives you um, a good um, idea of what the anatomy should look like when one is expressing milk from a bottle. So this um, is actually a beautiful picture of a child learning how to spoon feed. A lot of people would be very, um, you know, aversive to the fact that this child has it all over their, their face, but actually that's how children learn. And um, so, you know, I like that there's a lot of mess. I like that, um, you know, the child it doesn't appear to be too um, alarmed with having wetness on his face or her face. Um, and this is how they learn. You know, if you have a child that's spitting out food and blowing raspberries, that's all typical development. And again, going back to, you know, typical acquisition of feeding, that first six months of life, I'm not worried about them getting calories with pureed foods or baby foods. It's strictly for experience and exploration. Chewing, this is a great picture. This is um, something that I work on a lot when I'm trying to build skill with chewing with um, children long what I call rod foods and this uh, slide really captures that because you're getting the food in the back portion of the mouth you're eliciting um, you know that jaw strength and trying to get him to bite down strongly the more anterior the bite is the less strength you have and also eliciting what we call a transverse tongue so lateralizing the tongue that's how we keep the food in our cheek and it allows us to keep the bolus cohesive when we're chewing so that goes over very briefly typical development of um, feeding and, and swallowing acquisition skills for typical development. So now we're going to look at what can make feeding challenging for these children. And this is an um, example of a um, complete cleft palate. And so if you think back to the uh, first few slides that I showed about the, the sucking um, and the intraoral pressure that I talked about, the suck pads come together, so the cheek pads, and the tongue cups in a nicely, you know, nice groove, and the nipple sits in there, whether it's breast or bottle. And then the suck pads and the tongue allow the nipple to press up against the hard palate. Well, in this picture, this captures <coughs> where that hole is or where the cleft palate is. That will not allow for intraoral pressure, meaning baby cannot express the milk from the nipple. And so what we need to do is we need to assist them in that. So are there are specialty nipples that we can use, um, Haberman feeders, squeeze bottles. Um, there's even, you know, bottles that you can buy on the market now that um, are not specialty nipples that you can just squeeze into baby's mouth to allow them to get the, the milk out of the bottle. Low tone, um, which can be associated with neurodevelopmental disabilities, um, can also make feeding very challenging. Um, if you look at this baby here, he has Down's uh, syndrome, and you look at the jaw is at a fixed open position, tongue is posterior, uh, very uh, low tone in the cheeks. So again, if we're thinking about those sex pads needing to compress together, looking at the tongue needing to cup, and get a strong intraoral pressure in that jaw coming up to get good um, intraoral pressure. That's going to be challenging for this baby. A lot of times um, children will need jaw and cheek support uh, when they have such low tone like this. Cardiac and respiratory issues can also um, impact feeding. And looking back at that slide that where we had the three arrows and talking about the suck, swallow, breathe, you know, obligate nose breathers. Now we're constantly closing off our airway when we swallow. 
And so our pulmonary and respiratory compromise can be um, limited when we have cardiac and respiratory issues. And now we're asking a baby to suck, swallow, breathe, suck, swallow, breathe. So think about if you're on a treadmill or working out hard and then all of a sudden I give you a bottle of water and I'm asking you to chug it down. That's going to be challenging for you to do. And so that, that is a lot of times when I'm talking with parents associating with you know, their child that's in the ICU or, um, or even discharged from the hospital and having feeding challenges, you know, that, that is what it's comparable to when you have cardiac and respiratory issues or challenges when you're feeding. So what can we do uh, to help children um, who have feeding challenges? Well, a lot of times um, children with uh, neurodevelopmental disabilities uh, will require feeding tubes, and I'm sure a lot of you that are in the room would say that it's been um, something that you have experienced with your own child. And so nasogastric tube um, is something that is not as long-term. A lot of times uh, the physicians will recommend this type of tube if um, they feel that your child needs help for a shorter period of time with uh, nutrition and growth. Um, a lot of times physicians will not jump to a G-tube or a GJ tube unless they uh, know prognostically that your child will need uh, help or assistance with feeding for more long term. So these other three tubes are just uh, pictures or examples of feeding tubes um, that you actually may even have in your own children um, that assist or support with feeding. Just because a child has a feeding tube does not mean that they still cannot have an oral experience. Um, you know, a lot of times I'll talk with families and um, families are very resistant to feeding tubes. And, you know, I really try and encourage you as a, a parent and caregiver to look at it as support and something that will allow you to um, allow your child to grow and thrive so that way meal times can be pleasurable because if we're constantly forcing, if we're constantly um, stressed about meal times and feeding, that can really set up the relationship and um, behaviors associated with feeding to not be such a positive experience. So, you know, I, I will say that there is a place for feeding tubes. I don't think everybody should have a feeding tube, um, but at the same time, it, it is something that a lot of children do benefit from. So, you know, one of the things that I wanted to talk about with you today as well is what are red flags or what are things that could be happening during feeding time that, you know, you may think are normal things. Um, you know, I've had a lot of parents come in uh, to clinic and say, you know, well, I just kind of feed my baby all day. And um, you, that's what you do as a parent. You do anything that you need to do. But just knowing that that's not... Um, that's not healthy for you or the child. You know, you need a, you need a life outside of just feeding your baby all day. So um, I wanted to go over some things um, that would be red flags or things that you want to be looking for. So increased oral loss, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, every baby has some dribbling of formula or breast milk out, you know, the mouth. And as they get more efficient with their sucking, the, the amount of loss is less. Um, so if you're noticing, though, that the burp cloth and your lap after you're feeding them is drenched, that would be considered increased oral loss. And that might mean that there's low tone, a weak suck, or that they're guarding it and that they um, are getting too much flow from, from the um, nipple or breast, and um, that would need to be looked at further. Um, increased noise with suck, that to me a lot of times tells me that there's not good intraoral pressure like we've talked about which can, um, you know, it can be ankyloglossia, which means um, that frenulum is, is at the tongue tip and they're not getting good, you know, tongue um, cupping. But it can also mean um, a number of other things that haven't maybe necessarily been identified um, in the mouth. So um, noisy sucking um, is always something that I, I look at a lot more closely. Uh, poor latch to the nipple, you know, if baby's constantly pulling off, pulling away, you know, that's something that you want to look at further. Um, also, increased feeding times. Feeding times, you know, infants, yes, they're learning how to do this, and a lot of your time when you have an infant is, you know, feeding, changing diaper, and sleeping. And, um, but, you know, as they become older and, and more efficient with their sucking, feedings should not be taking longer than 30 minutes. 
stress signs. This is really um, important. Something that I really focus on is um, what we call cue-based feeding. So, you know, it's important to read your baby's cues and know when they're hungry um, and showing you those signs. A lot of babies, though, with neurodevelopmental disabilities will not do that. Um, their state, uh, it can be med medication, it can be um, due to their disability and their ability to know when they're hungry, know when they're full, um, have a, um, an adequate state of arousal is decreased. Um, so that can be challenging. Um, so if you're noticing, though, when they are awake and you're offering the bottle or the nipple and they're splaying their fingers, their eyes are very wide, they're pulling away, um, increased heart rate, diaphoretic, any of those things would definitely be stress signs and red flags during a feeding time. Also increased respiratory infection, infections, and um, what that can indicate is that the baby might be aspirating, meaning the food or liquid is going into their lungs, and that would be something that would need to be looked at further. So infants are different than older children. You know, we're talking about increased meal times in infants. Now we're looking at older children. They're much more efficient in their skills, and so feeding time should not be more than 20 or 30 minutes, and especially with their cognitive function, you know, ability to sustain attention is always challenging in toddlers and as they, as they emerge into um, older childhood. And so, you know, 20, 30 minutes max, um, you shouldn't be struggling for an hour or two at the table. Um, meal times should not be a struggle. Um, so if they are and they're not enjoyable, I would really encourage you to contact your primary care doctor or your pediatrician or um, even anybody that you're seeing here at The Mind um, that you're tapped into services uh, with to see a specialist for, for further assessment for feeding and swallowing. Um, if your child needs distractions, a lot of times that tells me that um, your child's trying to, for lack of a better term, check out of mealtime. Um, it's something that is not a learned behavior for him or her, and it's just not pleasurable. And um, so that's something that you want to be mindful of. They shouldn't need distractions during meal times. Uh, limited food variety. So less than 10 starches, 10 proteins, or 10 um, fruits and vegetables. So that would be more along the lines of problem feeder versus picky eater. Um, and that would be uh, wanting to look at more. You know, a lot of children that we see, especially on the spectrum, um, are children that will only eat crunchy, white, starchy foods. Um, you know, so um, if you're seeing any red flags in that arena as well, that would be something that you want to uh, get looked at further. And then also um, increased respiratory infections would go back to what we talked about earlier with infants, that that could indicate um, potential aspiration. And aspiration doesn't always necessarily mean from the top down, meaning when they're eating in their mouth and it goes down into their um, stomach um, and they're swallowing, that they're aspirating. It could also mean that they're refluxing or have um, some other esophageal immotility or, or um, abnormality that would need to be looked at further by a PEDS specialist, a PEDS GI specialist. So what can you do? Um, I touched on this a little bit um, earlier, but you know, if you're aware of the red flags, if any of these things that I talked about today that um, are concerning um, for you and your child in meal times, I would definitely encourage you to talk to your pediatrician or any a healthcare provider that you're tapped into services with, um, even if it's a, a regional center, um, you know, service. Uh, but talk to somebody about what your concerns are and and maybe describe what it is that you're seeing to see if it's something that warrants further um, evaluation. And if it is, um, or if you're on the fence about it, then get a referral. You know, that's one thing with pediatrics is that um, you know early intervention and. And the earlier you start, um, the better. So um, if you're having any questions at all, um, I would suggest you know, getting a referral to uh, a pediatric feeding team or a feeding therapist or specialist. And, and that's one thing that you want to make sure of is that they do specialize in this. Just because you're a speech pathologist or an occupational therapist doesn't mean necessarily that you specialize in feeding. And if you can get a comprehensive team, that's, that's even more beneficial.